currently don't see any, so all right.
for people to access the website.
Okay, we're fighting over two seconds.
Testing one, two, three. Testing. Testing. Testing, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me now? Ms. Shaw, can you hear me now? Hear me now? Or gentrification. Somebody turn hey, off the mute. mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Director Shaw, can you hear me now? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. 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 
One, two, three. Oh, a lot because <laughs> everybody we're sharing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we ready to go? Oh. Oh. For where? What part? <laughs> Thank you for your patience, everyone. We are ready to resume. And uh, Greg, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the technical staff that were able to quickly rectify the situation. So uh, I just gave a, a quick introduction into the RTO and T uh, and then moving into the strategic plan, uh, what we're doing here. And the, the purpose will ultimately to guide the call for projects for the set aside, uh, the, the RTO and T set aside uh, that's identified in the TIP. Uh, so we're looking to develop uh, the strategic plan, moving into the uh, development of the evaluation of uh, procedures and application process, and then uh, uh, beginning of next year, look for the, the call for projects process to allocate what's identified now mm -hmm. about 60 million in capital funding uh, for the, the fiscal years 24 through 27. There we go. Um, so uh, to illustrate what we're doing with the, the document, we started out uh, you know, uh, identifying vision and goals uh, based on the Met uh, Metro Vision, Dr. Cog Metro Vision, and the Mobility Choice Blueprint, uh, a you know, technology planning document that was uh, developed a couple of years ago. Uh, and then um, identified uh, objectives to meet those visions and goals. And we've been uh, working with the, uh, the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Operations Working Group, which is, uh, includes uh, RTD, CDOT, uh, lo local jurisdictions uh, at the technical level, uh, providing uh, input to, to the process. The Advanced Mobility Partnership, uh, that is the um, technology group that has, uh, was developed out of the mobility, juice, <laughs> mobility, juice, mobility choice blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've uh, gotten some input from uh, the Dr. Cog TAC as well. And the, the plan itself uh, is starting out with high level uh, operational concept uh, that we've uh, broken down into several transportation service areas to focus uh, the discussions to make it a little easier to, uh, to communicate. Uh, you'll see that in a, in a subsequent slide. But I'll also point out that that also matches with the federally required uh, development of a regional ITS architecture where an operational concept uh, is, is the core to how that uh, architecture is developed. And that's important because the architecture is important because it's the first step for the systems engineering analysis, another federal requirement for all technology projects in the region that are federally funded. Uh, and uh, I, I think I skipped over in the last slide, but we're the, we're the final uh, outcome of, of the strategic plan is identify near-term regional initiatives things that are going to build to uh, what we're looking to achieve here in the region from operations perspective. Uh, and, and that is going to lead into the, uh, uh, the, the call for projects. So we, our vision statement is here. I'm not going to read through it word for word, but I wanted to highlight, you know, echoing the uh, regional, integrated, and collaborative uh, keywords coming out of Mobility Choice Blueprint uh, that this vision is identifying through in interconnected and collaborative uh, and, and, and looking for reliable and efficient uh, and safe operations in the region. And the goals that stem from that, we have safe operations, uh, as I just mentioned, efficient and seamless travel. And again, that's where it requires interconnected operations across jurisdictions and modes and cooperatively managing uh, both the, the systems and any support 
uh, like travel information systems to uh, be able to provide the public uh, good service. Uh, trip travel time reliability is you know, both a, a real-time uh, performance measure, but also kind of an archive performance measure to look for declines in performance. Uh, but being able to uh, achieve that, I mean, we need real-time data and comparisons to archive data to ensure that we are uh, doing the best we can with the, the network as it stands. Equitable access, uh, equity has, uh, has been uh, uh, something that was added early on to this process and the environmental sustainability uh, that is, was the core of the genesis of this program, starting with the traffic, traffic signal system improvement program about three decades ago, maybe even longer now. Uh, it's time marches on, um, uh, but that, that was the core to what we're providing. So it's, it's clear uh, from this uh, that we have um, <clears throat> a description of something that the scope and purpose uh, you know, demands, you know, regional administration and management. Um, and there's also a need to uh, provide a lot of cooperation and collaboration between uh, the different entities. Um, in our discussions uh, in the development of, the, of this uh, and in some recent uh, interactions between our partners, uh, it seems that, you know, we we don't have a full and strong commitment to uh, continue to work together uh, and, and achieve uh, the objectives that, that we're looking to do here. These are the actual uh, performance measures to achieve the, the goals that we identified on the last slide. Uh, I'll go through them, uh, you know, looking to increase trip tra travel time reliability related specifically to that one goal. Minimize travel delay due to signal operations, uh, uh, but th those operations could be extended to any of the operations that we're uh, providing. Uh, maximize transportation operations, infrastructure reliability and availability, uh, meaning that we've got to keep the system well maintained and working to be able to uh, uh, achieve what we're, we're looking to do. Improve transit operations performance, improve safety and reduce crashes, fatalities and injuries. Reduce average incident duration and disruption. Reduce occurrence of secondary incidents. And reduce emergency responder roadway workers struck by incidents, which is a, a new goal that the Traffic Incident Management Program at CDOT has identified and we embrace. Uh, and improve air quality and reduce transportation-related emissions. So we've thrown a lot of thoughts out there um, with, uh, in these last couple of slides. And so it would be a good a point to take a break to see if there's any thoughts or input on um, what we've just covered. Anyone have any? Oh, Director Stan, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And I appreciate a really good brief. And I, you mentioned 4,000 signals. And I know at CDOT we're trying to possibly look at synchronizing signals. Let's take Federal Boulevard as an example. That crosses many jurisdictions, Westminster, et cetera. There's also a huge safety factor, not just car crashes, but pedestrian and bikes. And are you, when you're factoring these in, are you giving some sort of weight to those safety factors? Um, well, safety, from the operations perspective, safety is the number one uh, focus of what, what we're doing. So when, at, and, and, we, and you, you mentioned traffic signals, that's, that's something that we have, uh, there is a, a traffic signal uh, timing uh, group within Dr. Cog here providing services, so it's something that we're quite familiar with. And we are looking to make sure to provide um, a safe crossing for the bicycles and pedestrians um, and, uh, while also uh, addressing good progression along a corridor for the other uh, modes uh, so that it is safer for the other, uh, for pedestrians and bicycles with the gaps between, you know, good platooning moving through, we can have safer crossing and uh, have a greater efficiency in, along the corridor. So yes, we are considering it. Um, the, this, the, it's built into the purpose of operations that we do safety. That, uh, yes, I just think we often always say safety is number one. But if you can quantify the cost of an accident or avoidance of an accident or loss of life, that sometimes makes 
the ability to spend for the cost of synchronizing lights or other things more important. So I'm just throwing that out. I think it should be quantified. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions? So go ahead, Director Cook. Shelly, could you use the mic? Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you might improve transit operations performance. And just one time years ago in Los Angeles, um, they had a system where if uh, there was a barcode on the buses and if they they compared it to the schedule, if the bus was running behind, they could uh, clear the lights ahead of it to allow it to catch up. Is there anything like that could that could be implemented? Yes, uh, that is is one of the initiatives identified in the Mobility Choice Blueprint. But it's something that we've been working on for for years. Uh, so uh, transit priority, uh, uh, talk about it in a broader sense. So there's a lot of applications, uh, physical infrastructure applications, to make the the uh, things better uh, for operations of the bus. So I could uh, point to uh, ticketing or fare stations at the the platforms, so that the, you know nothing has to happen as you as you board. Uh, level boarding, so to make it easier to get on and off the bus. Uh, they have uh, ball boats, uh, meaning that the the the, um, the bus uh, platform is out in the, the the roadway, so the bus doesn't have to pull off and then try and get back in. So all those things are uh, for improving the operations of of transit. But what we've been we've been involved with on the signal side is transit signal priority, and that's exactly what you just described. That the 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 the, uh, the vehicle uh, communicates with the infrastructure, saying. I'm approaching, and depending on the phase of the signal, uh, it, it will change its operation to accommodate the, the bus. Uh, so, yes, is the short answer to my long answer. Thank you. Is that all? Thank you. Director Coleman. Yeah, Greg, um, when I looked at this, one thing that seems to be missing is when I see minimized travel or delay to signal <coughs> operations, it seems like we should also be looking at minimizing delay due to crashes or other incidents, say water pipeline breaks or something. And that's where it seems the true power of interconnectivity really comes together is trying to reroute traffic around crashes or around incidents, some that are pre-planned but mostly not pre-planned. Could you, when I looked at that, I saw it in seamless travel a little bit, but then when you came to these measures, I didn't see it. So if I can kind of paraphrase your question, it seems like you're looking, we need to improve the situational awareness of our operators so that they are better able to manage the system uh, regardless of the, the, um, the, the problems they're facing. Is that? Well, and, and what I would say is let's just take a crash on I-25 at 104th or you know, maybe 103rd. So you're trying to get the traffic off of the interstate over to Washington Street or over to Federal. Um, and then what happens is you just inundate those systems because they're set for time of day, whatever they're trying to do. But now you're throwing, you know, maybe a thousand cars more an hour onto the corridor, which we want because we want to clear it out to reduce the travel delay, to reduce secondary incidents, all these other causations that happen due to those long tedious backups. And again, I use the example of water pipeline breaks, which seemed we're going to see more and more of those because of the age of the system. So you, you pose university, you know, how are you going to get the traffic around there? How do the signals work? Maybe where you don't have to have the human interaction, it's already pre planned it's pre thought because you know where those likelihoods are. Yes. We have to have multiple jurisdictions uh, responding to incidents because it, what, like what you're saying, a water break, a crash on the freeway, uh, the, it's going to impact you whether you want it or not. Uh, so working together to uh, address the, what's coming and be able to support, uh, you know, like, like you're saying, uh, in the case of a crash on the freeway, having diversions onto the arterial network is very problematic. Uh, because arterials weren't built to serve a freeway's worth of traffic. Uh, so you would need multiple arterials. So that requires a lot more coordination. 
so yes, uh, I agree. And so um, that is, is that's exactly where we're heading in in the slides here. And like you know, there are tools that we need to be able to achieve the things that, that you're saying. Um, but it it seems that that we're we're missing an objective related. That to would that. be my sense. Due to signal operations, crashes, or other incidents. Okay, so expand that one and not just focus. Good, just or you could add additional. Okay, I, I, I understand. Gotcha. Thank you, Jeff. Other questions, uh, Director White? Go ahead. I'm I'm curious about the phrasing of the last bullet, and this is a, a minor point, but isn't it improving air quality by reducing transportation emissions? Uh, yeah. Um, our, I, I agree that the reducing the transportation related emissions is the thing that we can kind of control, that we have influence over. Uh, and the, the secondary result is that the air quality is going to improve. So, yes, we can uh, use that word. Thank you. Was that it, Director White? Thank you. Director Williams. So it looks to me like a lot of what we're working on here involves congestion. And I'm just wondering if we could share what we create out of this with um, the airport because they are having serious congestions there. And as they're one of our major economic factors, that perhaps we could talk to them a little bit. Thank you, Director. Are you talking about Pena Boulevard? Are you talking about I'm the talking TSA? I'm talking about the TSA, the okay. pedestrians inside the airport who are in a congestion situation that might benefit from some of the same technological concepts that we are working on developing here. Or maybe they have stuff that they might share with us, although we are talking about cars, the dreaded car. And they are talking about foot traffic, but I, it appears to me, as somebody who recently stood for 40 minutes in a line, that there's some correlation in congestion. Mm -hmm. We have reduced crashes, though, out there in the line. <laughs> but but, uh, but I just, just uh, you know, not not to get too detailed, but the project out there will result in very good uh, passenger flow once it's done. But we've had to take. Uh, I, I chair the committee that oversees the airport there, and we've had to take lines out of out of service in order to create the new TSA screening on level six. When that is all done, it'll flow very nicely. What can they teach us then? I'll let you know when I find out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Greg, I have a couple of questions. The, uh, uh, the 1,300 cameras, CCTV cameras, are they, does that count only uh, live pan tilt zoom? Or are they static cameras uh, that uh, operators cannot move or zoom in, that sort of thing? And how many different agencies contribute to that interconnected pool? Can, and can they see one another's cameras? Can Denver's Traffic Operations Center, for instance, if there's a problem on Colfax, can they view any cameras from Lakewood to see what's happening upstream, that sort of thing? All right. To answer your question, the, that stat is the pan tilt zoom traffic cameras. Wow, come. good. So it's it's not uh, identifying the other cameras you may see, which are actually detectors, they're video detectors, they're, they're the static view. And it is also not including any of the security cameras uh, that uh, you know oh. RTD might have, or uh, or even the infrastructure security cameras that might be like on the underside deck of a mm -hmm. viaduct. Um, it's interesting that you ask about sharing cameras. Um, we used to share cameras. Uh, we used to have a common uh, uh, statewide license for the video management system. Uh, so multiple jurisdictions were able to um, uh, share their cameras. Uh, that could both just be a, a video feed or it could be actual for full control. control uh, yeah. depending on the agreement between the agencies. Uh, and the, uh, in the past, uh, the region even invested in the development of common maps to illustrate where the, the shared cameras are. Um, but, you know, at the current situation, there's a new uh, video management system that's been deployed uh, at, at 
uh, CDOT. And so a lot of the sharing uh, situations that we had uh, currently do not exist. Uh, there's been requests to, to share, um, but uh, the CDOT's not ready to accommodate that. At the local level, um, <clears throat> the, they're, not, they're not as well suited to be able to share between jurisdictions without the support uh, that, that was previously there uh, mm -hmm. at the statewide level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Shaw. Um, but, it, but can't you view a lot of the CDOT uh, footage online? Yep. So, it's, so it is public. It's not that they're not necessarily sharing, but they're not sharing with traffic watchers. <clears throat> so there is a, a low-res uh, view online. Uh, that yeah, you're right is available to everyone. There's no ability to control those cameras uh, from that. There is another tool that that can allow that, but is um, access to that tool is limited currently uh, to, to CDOT. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of sharing, but the you know the, the purpose of, of the cameras is to be able to get a view of of what's going on. So if there's a crash. Uh, the operators would like to see the, the details of that crash, sharing it with the first responders and their dispatch so mm -hmm. they understand the details, so they send the right equipment. Uh, all, all of that is, is important. So there's a lot of uh, interactivity with uh, traffic cameras uh, in, in more than just the travel information component that, that you identified. Excellent. Thank you. Director Williams. All right. So the name of this group implies that it would be looking at creating those sharing opportunities to improve the system. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, Greg, I have one more question. Um, I don't know if, if you'll have an answer for this, but do we have any data or any analysis that would tell us it, is safety enhanced or is it not enhanced by improving the progression of signal timing or by intentionally stopping traffic? And would that be different if it were a rural or a suburban corridor versus uh, Broadway in Denver, for example, where you have a lot of pedestrians and bikes? On Saturday, I managed to go from on Wadsworth Boulevard from 72nd all the way down to Bellevue. I think I had got one red light, uh, but is that safer? should I have been intentionally stopped more often? Do we have any uh, crash data or injury data that would educate us on what's there, better? There, there have been reports uh, illustrating that the, the safety benefits of, of progression. Okay. Uh, so, you know, like, should we be purposely stopping uh, the vehicles? We do. Well, yeah. Like you, just like you said, we stop most most of them anyway. Yeah, we we stop to allow for the the, the crossing uh, modes of travel, the the traffic and and pedestrians and bicycles. Um, the uh, yeah, and then kind of getting more into just kind of the gut feel of it. The expectations of travelers are met, and they are less willing to take risks. You know, I'm I'm, I'm talking anecdotally here and not uh, from data, but <clears throat> I think that the, in my gut, that's uh, where, where the, the space safety benefits uh, stem from. Uh, and, and that way everyone is, is, uh, is getting out of the network what they're expecting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, I think you have four more slides. Yeah. All right. I will be quick. Thank you. Thank you. For the input. I appreciate that. So this is just quickly the, uh, the transportation service areas that, that I mentioned that we broke up the discussion. Uh, it's highlighting that you know, data management is the, is the foundation uh, uh, for uh, being able to do real-time uh, regional operations. Um, uh, and uh, travel information, traffic incident management, those are things that we mentioned, the roadway management, transit operations, all, all those things uh, that, that we've already mentioned. So the, um, the, the data information sharing framework that we're working with uh, has, and getting back to some of our previous discussion, we, uh, we need to provide a situational awareness platform 
uh, to be able for the operators and uh, emergency staff to be able to take action. Uh, so understanding, you know, what are the, the, the real-time uh, multimodal conditions, uh, focusing on disruptions. So where are there crashes? Where are there water main breaks? Uh, where is there construction work zones? Uh, and then having that awareness uh, beyond your own uh, physical borders so that you know uh, what to expect, what's coming your way, or where not to uh, um, direct traffic. Uh, similarly, need a uh, performance monitoring um, uh, platform uh, to be able to access and visualize the, the, the data that we have and looking for a trending performance. Uh, and and the, again, uh, that would uh, be, need to be you know, compared with archive data to, to see like, uh, you know, like on a, on a day typically like this, we should be here, but we're here and being able to look at those uh, forms of performance measures. And then um, kind of some of the things that we were just talking about that we need a uh, regional traveler information platform. Uh, currently, we have a number of separate um, uh, traveler information resources that requires the public to access to be able to make multimodal decisions. What we're talking about is that we need a, a common platform uh, so that the operator will be able to see the, their mobility options uh, all in one place and be able to make the decision in one place. And I'll note that this framework is, has been described as, as being flexible, Oops, I'm sorry, uh, in that it could be working with uh, direct integration. We can have system-to-system -system, uh, interconnection. Uh, we could be working with uh, a data feeds through APIs. Uh, we can uh, uh, purchase data or you get a, th a third, uh, third party uh, platform to provide these services or hybrid of all these. The, the, all of these are still possible. At this, at this stage, we've uh, identified this as operational concept, but we don't have the champions yet uh, stepping forward and defining specifically uh, what these pro products are going to be. Uh, and that's going to be the next stage of, of alternatives analysis as we move into uh, uh, project uh, definition and selection. Uh, so very quickly, as I mentioned, this is a high-level concept. Uh, it, we, we emphasize that real-time data is essential to operate, ma manage, and maintain a safe and reliable transportation system. It's uh, got to be collaborative, regional, integrated uh, in, in approach to be able to achieve that. Um, and I just mentioned, you know, the, the data uh, platform. Um, and then finally, the, the scale and purpose requires that we have regional administration and management uh, of what's going on. So that, I, I quickly made it to the end of the slides that you look for. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Director Stanton, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a comment back to what Rebecca said about greenhouse gases. Could you possibly with that as a conclusion also, as you move ahead, always include the reduction of greenhouse gases because what you're proposing here with technology should help in that overall goal. Thank you, I agree. Thank you, anything else? Seeing none, thank you very much, Greg, appreciate it. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, the next item is item six, housing and the regional transportation planning process, Andy Taylor. Attachment D. Thank you. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to run the uh, regional planning and analytics teams here at Dr. Cog. I'm also joined by Alvin Bidal Sanchez, who will be presenting some of today's material on the connection between housing and transportation planning here at Dr. Cog. Uh, here's an outline of what we have to cover. Apologies to those who, who already saw some of this material at the board work session, but because um, I think this uh, presentation originally came out of RTC, wanted, we wanted to bring it here as well. Um, I'll get us started about uh, talking about the current practice uh, at Dr. Cog related to housing's connection uh, to transportation planning. Um, Alvin will share some examples of how that practice was used uh, in the 2015 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, he's also got a couple slides on uh, new direction we received from Congress uh, late in 2021. 
and then I'll pick it back up um, and talk about uh, timelines around some of this. Um, and we've also got some slides that um, we can have some discussion about if there's time. Uh, so uh, before we launch into future paths, uh, we'd like to share about our current work uh, in this area. Uh, we have a tendency just to skip this part. Uh, land use and transportation are connected, how we grow as a region, uh, where we develop influences, future travel patterns. Um, but travel, transportation and travel needs also influence location choices uh, of people and businesses. And a significant uh, part of my team uh, spends quite a bit of time trying to predict uh, future growth and development because of this uh, connection. Uh, all that work starts with data. Uh, one of our best sources uh, is with local governments uh, through our annual data request. Uh, we supplement that as needed uh, through public sources like the Census Bureau, as well as private sources that we license. Uh, we also develop data um, from our long-running programs for aerial imagery partnerships, and we also coordinate with many local governments in the region uh, through those partnerships, uh, not stopping just at the images, but also developing uh, more data sets uh, to help us analyze what's on the ground. Um, apologies, I use this slide a lot uh, to talk about uh, my team's work, uh, but this metaphor is the best way to understand where growth and development and also housing in there uh, fits in. We're one leg in this uh, relay race. Uh, we rely on the state mandated work of the demography office uh, in the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Uh, they forecast jobs, households, and population out to 2050 currently, and they do that for all 64 counties in the state. Uh, some folks may be more familiar with their estimates that they do annually that do go down to the jurisdiction level, uh, but their forecast work does not go down below the county level. So that's where our work begins at Dr. Cog. Uh, we forecast uh, the internal distribution of those 2050 forecasts to 2,804 small areas, which are also called uh, zones or transportation analysis zones. Uh, we use a predictive model called UrbanSim to do this work, uh, but rely heavily on local data about zoning, uh, for example. And uh, we also go through substantial zone level review by local governments. Uh, the travel demand modeling work uh, can then use those zone level forecasts to better understand future travel demand between zones on the transportation network. Uh, that also happens at Dr. Cog and also for others doing uh, more targeted studies. And Alvin has some slides to show how this forecasting work can also be applied in some of the what if scenarios that we did as part of the 2050 MetroVision regional transportation planning process. Good morning, everyone. So I'll go ahead and run through uh, the land use component of our scenario work that we did for our 2050 regional transportation plan. There was also a transportation component, but I'll just be touching on the land use piece today. Uh, there were two land use scenarios, infill and centers, both pulled directly from language included in MetroVision, and they focus growth around different areas of the region. I'm moving from left to right in each of these as you move from our baseline to our infill to our center scenario, you can see that growth is getting more focused, more intense in smaller areas of the region. Uh, infill focused that growth in the urban area and inner suburban areas, and then the centers was focused around rapid transit stations, urban centers, and employment centers. In addition to the maps we developed, we also looked at different outcomes. Uh, the two tables on your screen, the top one shows different outcomes that we have established in MetroVision that have performance targets associated with them. And then the second table looks at some additional outcomes that just help tell the story of each of these different scenarios. Uh, again, as you move from left to right, from our baseline into our infill and our center scenario, we're getting more centers focused, uh, more intense development in a smaller area of the region, uh, more the median distance between households in that second table is shorter between that top employment centers, um, more areas of the region that are single family stay single family as you're focusing that growth in a smaller area of the region. And so uh, as we move left to right, get into our more centers focused scenario, we get closer to achieving our Metro vision targets that we've established. And then the last couple slides related to our scenario work is a big summary of some interesting facts, some interesting outcomes from each of these scenarios. Infill, again, is just a land use scenario by itself. There were no additional transportation investments beyond our baseline. But even with just the land use scenario, you're seeing a decrease in 
in VMT. People in vehicles experience less delay on average. There's twice as many transit trips. The graphic on the bottom left of your screen is a quick summary of what these different metrics are moving in, uh, in up or down, whether that helps us achieve our Metro Vision targets. So uh, moving left to right, VMT is decreasing. Transit trips are increasing. Walk-bike trips are increasing. And delay is decreasing. Uh, even with that movement, we're not meeting our reduced vehicle miles travel target. We're not meeting our reduced single occupancy vehicle target, but we are meeting our minimized delay target that's established in Metro Vision. And then our center scenario, again, was focused around rapid transit stations, urban centers, and employment centers. Again, just a land use scenario by itself, no additional transportation investments. There's still a decrease in VMT. There are now three times as many transit trips occurring in the region, twice as many walk-bike trips. The graphic on the bottom left of your screen reflects that different scale of movement in transit and walk-bike trips. We are now meeting our reduced single occupancy vehicle target, but we're still not meeting our reduced vehicle miles travel target with this center scenario. In addition to our federal requirements and our federal planning framework, we also rely on Metro Vision for all of our different plans. So the regional transportation plan is one way that we implement Metro Vision. Um, there are two pieces to that, our vision plan, which talks about what we need in the region over the next 20 to 30 years, and then our fiscally constrained plan, which talks about what can we actually afford over the next 20 to 30 years. And then just as the RTP implements Metro Vision, we also have our short range plan, the transportation improvement program that implements the RTP. So what are we funding over the next four years? What's actually being built? What are project sponsors working on in the region with federal and state funds? I'll start off this section of the presentation just talking about what's changed as a result of the passage and the signing of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, and then pass it back over to Andy. Uh, so Dr. Cog is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. Um, as that designated entity, we do have some requirements that come down from Congress. So we are required to meet certain pieces uh, that they um, pass down. So one of those is one of uh, 10 federal planning factors that we were required to take into consideration in our uh, planning process. Um, through the passage and signing of the IIJA, the addition of housing was included in one of those planning factors. So uh, the memo as well as the presentation are just highlighting where that addition of housing was included. Um, and Andy will go over some of the additional pieces that are open up to us now. Um, but through that one addition of housing into this existing planning factor, we are adding uh, an activity task to our Unified Planning Work Program, and that's our two-year work plan that outlines what Dr. Cog, CEDA, and RTD are working on over the next two years with federal and state funds. What are the deliverables we're looking at achieving over the next two years? What actions are we taking? What tasks are we looking at implementing over the next two years? So we've added this new one, Incorporate Housing, into the Metropolitan Planning Process. Um, we think we're already meeting this. Uh, what the, housing, the addition of housing through the IIJ has done is really just formalize this process and expand the options that are available to Dr. Cog, which Andy will go over. And so with that uh, work now identified in our planning work program, uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for um, what some of these new opportunities really mean for us. Um, there was additional language related to housing that was added uh, throughout the, the pieces of code of United States code that apply to us as a metropolitan planning organization. And there's a big chunk added related to a brand new piece called a housing coordination plan that we may pursue. Um, addressing this integration that we've described of how housing, transportation, economic development, how all these things are related. Um, but for the sake of, of this and clarity, what they're really describing is a housing transportation coordination plan. Um, I've just changed what we're calling it for, for this purpose because it really is um, taken as a given within where it is that it is connecting housing and transportation. Um, so I'll be referring to it as that um, as we discuss it a little bit. Um, but some things haven't changed quite yet. Um, even though we have this guidance from Congress, we do often have to wait um, for, for additional guidance uh, coming down uh, through a rulemaking process. Uh, sometimes that can take longer than others. Um, sometimes we may not really get that much guidance. Um, in, in the past, we've had a different type of coordinated plan that we do for human services, transportation, uh, and public transit coordination. Uh, that guidance took two years. I don't think that's the path we're headed down with this. I also don't think we're probably headed down the same path that we did with the safety performance measure, where it took um, uh, a, quite a bit of time um, to, to really implement a whole suite of performance measures and get a lot of input on that. 
And so it could probably be that we'll get um, one set of guidance uh, in the Federal Register um, as a proposed set of rules related to um, interpreting what this uh, this now means uh, for us and then what we could interpret um, the uh, coordinated plan to mean. And so um, with the permission of the chair, um, I'll open this up to questions um, about uh, some of these objectives. Uh, these are the potential goals that we could pursue um, as part of a housing transportation coordination plan about improving commutes, um, connecting housing and transportation, doing more transit-oriented development, something that we've pursued as a region quite a bit, um, more housing-oriented transportation improvements, aligning transportation improvements with housing needs and, and where there are potentially current affordable housing options, uh, less vehicle miles traveled, um, trying to achieve less growth in VMT um, from additional housing and economic development, um, trying to achieve more affordability because housing and transportation are such significant portions uh, of a household budget and they are connected. There's often trade-offs that people are making as they're trying to find affordable housing. It might increase their transportation costs and vice versa. And so how do we align and make different investments uh, to improve affordability uh, regardless of, of, of folks' income and improve access? Um, increase that share of housing that, that does have quality access to, to jobs and, and things to meet people's daily needs. So this is largely what we know about uh, housing transportation coordination plan at the moment um, that, that really we could um, identify, we could pursue these types of objectives or goals. Thank you. I don't know uh, how you would pick only the top three there. I would prefer to try to weave some of them together and, and take a coordinated approach. But uh, Director Cook, go ahead. Thank you. And I have to go, so I, I appreciate you letting me go up. Um, I wanted to just highlight one issue that I've, I've run across in, in Arvada. I'm helping out with an affordable development. It's a third of a mile from the train station. Um, but the investors uh, related to the tax credit financing are balking about reduced parking requirements. So if there's a way to, in a suburban setting especially, to bring the data to the fore in the, in the way that Chessie has, but to, to make that more formalized, um, that I think would be a huge help in, in terms of TOD and especially affordable complexes in outlying areas. Thank you. Director Williams, you're jumping out of your chair. Um, I'm also working with uh, affordable housing where they've gotten through. Uh, in Denver, the requirement is that you have 10% um, parking designated, but uh, Chaffa turned them down because Chaffa has different laws. And so they are unable to complete the affordable housing near transit, which is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about because of Chaffa's regulations. So um, I think that we ought to be looking at that. Matter of fact, I want to meet with Jeff tomorrow and raise hell. Um, it's not just you guys. The other thing I want to point out is that in my understanding, RTD and Dr. Cog have pretty much the same footprint. And I did not see the mention of the Regional Transportation Agency any place in all of these planning documents. Um, RTD does have a TOD department, as Shelley mentioned. My name, um, we have had, and I would think when you're doing this planning, I know you're looking at 2050. I'm not sure how in the world anybody's looking at 2050 uh, myself, but I, I think that if you overlaid the development of housing with the changes that RTD makes three times a year, to their routes and their, there's a bunch of statistics there that might give some information. And, uh, and I'm hoping that you guys are coordinating with RTD to get that kind of information because although we're looking at 2050, we might have some historical information there that's relevant. That's all I have to say on behalf of the local transit agency. <laughs> Thank you. Director Papstor. Um, thank you, Director Williams, um, for the comment. I think we didn't specifically list RTD or nor CDOT 
in this presentation, they are our partners in our metropolitan planning process and part of the MPO. We're, we're the planning organization, but our partners include RTD and CDOT in terms of um, meeting our federal requirements as the MPO. So any of this work will, will certainly and absolutely include RTD and CDOT in that planning work. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of doing anything related to TOD uh, without talking to Chessie at least early and often. So, uh, yeah. Without the T. Yeah. Right. No D without the T. Any other uh, questions? More discussion? Dr uh, Director Olguin. John, okay. So I guess I don't know how we do select the top three objectives. Well, two of those, number one and number five, seem to be so interconnected to me that when we're looking at affordability, housing affordability, aligning transportation and housing to improve affordability in connection to improving commutes. And, and I say this because oftentimes a lot of our low-income neighborhoods that are being, um, where the development is happening, they haven't necessarily had the connectivity needed so that they can actually get on, rely on public transportation to ensure that they can get to their job on time. I, in waiting for the bus one day, I met a young man who said, I lost three jobs because I couldn't get there on time. Wow. The reliability is just difficult. And so as we're thinking about the affordability aspect, I definitely think it needs to go hand in hand with improving commutes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, in Denver, uh, Director White, go ahead. No, I go last. Okay, all right. I was just going to add that six, as currently written, sort of feels like what we've always done, and I'll just share their perspective of CDOT. You know, as can grow, we go build roads or widen roads to account for that. So unless there's sort of more meant by six, I feel like that is for infrastructure houses. Okay. Um, not necessarily transit or other ways to move people around. Thank you. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I was going to say was, uh, Director Olguin was, um, at least in Denver, it's been my observation that where we have increased the density, which is uh, an, a, co a component to increasing the use of transit, we have effectively uh, I don't, destroyed might be the wrong word, but we've we've injured affordability. Uh, some of our neighborhoods that are densifying are some of the most unaffordable neighborhoods in the city. Uh, look at Northwest Denver. Look at Overland right now. Uh, so that's I don't I don't know how you tackle that. If density were uh, were the answer to affordability, I could move to Manhattan tomorrow, but I can't. Right. So. Uh, we, we really have to think about this. And on the council, we are considering implementing House Bill 1117 to require a uh, certain uh, floor of affordable income restricted affordable units in every project that's over 10 units, 10 units or more. But my observation is that neighborhoods are being made unaffordable by the one-offs, the, uh, the two unit zoning and, and, and investors coming in scraping off affordable bungalows and putting up way unaffordable duplex units. And, and that's where our problem lies with, with displacement. And boy, we, I didn't really want to go there, but that, that just touched a nerve. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion on this? Uh, go ahead, Andy. Um, so uh, when might you see us again on these topics? Again, this is something we are, we are considering at the moment, uh, pursuing um, what this housing transportation coordination plan could be. Um, it's not something we've put in our, our, our work program yet, so we are investigating how to integrate housing as we've been mandated to, and that will include uh, considering this possibility. So um, we'll be uh, looking, keeping an eye out in the Federal Register for the, that guidance or those rules, uh, but we're also, I think, just looking uh, at what some, some precedents are uh, of this kind of work uh, throughout the country. Um, to try and understand uh, which way we, we might go with this. And so the feedback that we heard today, the feedback we heard at board work session is very helpful and, and as we try and figure out um, what we might scope uh, if we pursue this. 
And so um, there, there's uh, additional work that's, that's somewhat related, tangentially related, that the board has been talking about uh, related to um, a regional housing strategy. Uh, but this is somewhat distinct from that. Um, so so it, it, we just wanted to make it clear that this does uh, potentially fall outside uh, the scope of, of what that might pursue. So that's what we've got. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Alvin, I'm told that you are up next in place of Jacob to do the item 7 2050 regional transportation plan greenhouse gas update. We all drove down here alone to hear this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> I said that for Director Stanton. <laughs> All right, morning everyone. Uh, as introduced, my name is Alvin Vidal Sanchez, planner here at Dr. Cog. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am taking over this presentation for Jacob, who could unfortunately not be here this morning. should be corrected. Um, so I'm going to run through some key points to get the conversation started. Uh, some will be reminders, some will be refreshers, uh, and then we'll get started into where we are in our analysis update process. So a reminder that we are working towards a deadline of October 1st of this year to have a revised 2050 RTP adopted that meets the GHG reduction targets established in the rule. Um, throughout this presentation, you're going to hear a reference to a baseline. When it comes to the GHG rule, that's the modeled 2050 RTP as adopted last April. And those emission reduction targets are then based off of that baseline that we've established. A key piece that relates to the modeled RTP as adopted last April is that our modeling didn't include programmatic or category investments, and these make up a large percentage of the plan. So the lump sums of cash that are in the plan that don't have specific projects attached to them, but we know are going to be spent in the region, and we know have uh, impact on mobility in the region. We've established our draft baseline and are now working on uh, quantifying what those programmatic investments, the GHG reduction benefits from those actually mean in terms of how we can show those in the model and how much closer we get to our GHG reduction targets. Uh, but even with our programmatic analysis, we know that there will need to be additional strategies to meet our GHG reduction targets. There are uh, four key steps in our analysis that we're looking at. Uh, first was establishing that baseline. So what are the roadway and transit system networks in each analysis here from the adopted 2050 RTP? What are the future regionally significant projects, those roadway capacity expansions, those rapid transit projects that are included in the plan? Um, that helps us establish our baseline GHG emission values for each of the analysis years, and that's 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. That second step is in where we're looking at those programmatic investments. How much, money, how much money is going towards pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure? How much money is going to safety operations? And how can we start to quantify what the emissions reduction benefits from those types of projects are in our model? Um, even with that, like I mentioned, we don't expect to fully achieve our reduction targets through our programmatic analysis. So we're now in steps three and four where we're looking at taking into consideration those cycle amendments that we solicited earlier in the year, as well as some targeted scope changes to projects, advancing some BRT corridors, uh, potentially freeing up some additional funding earlier for some of these programmatic investments. And we're also looking at what are some potential GHG mitigation measures that the region could commit to and annually track if we go the route of the mitigation action plan. And all of this is uh, targeted so that we can achieve our GHG reduction targets and not face a restriction on the federal funds that Dr. Cog administers in the MPO region. Uh, table one, you all have seen before, pulled directly from the rule. Each of the five MPOs, as well as CDOT for the non-MPO areas, has emission reduction levels in annual million metric tons for each analysis year. So the first row on the table for Dr. Cog are the emission reduction levels that we have to achieve that analysis year. So 0.27 million metric tons in 2025, 0.82 million metric tons in 2030, 0.63 
in 2040 and 0.37 in 2050. You're going to see these numbers again on the, slide, the forthcoming slide. So if you can try and remember those, commit them to memory, you'll see how they build into our baseline and emission reduction analysis. Like I mentioned, staff have established a draft baseline of our GHG reduction of our baseline GHG emissions that we already have in the adopted plan for each of these analysis years. That's that second row on the table, 14.64 uh, in 2025, 9.23 in 2030, 6.22 in 2040, and 3.70 in 2050. These are all in uh, annual million metric tons. You're seeing those values again from the previous slide. What are those reduction levels that we need to achieve in each of those analysis years compared to where we are right now with our adopted plan? And what are those GHG emissions right now? Um, Taking those into consideration, we're also provided the percent reduction we're looking at needing to achieve. So 1.8% by 2025, and then 8.9% by 2030, and roughly 10% in 2040 and 2050. So some pretty aggressive targets that we're looking at achieving through our programmatic analysis and some potential additional strategies we're evaluating. Tied to our programmatic analysis, staff have been looking at the different categories we have in the plan. What do we think has a GHG emission reduction benefit? So some of these you would expect, uh, transit, bicycle, pedestrian, operations. Um, how can we start to quantify the funding that's in the plan and add those to the, take those into consideration when we're doing GHG emission reduction benefits? So taking um, each of these, what's not modeled in the plan, what has a GHG emission reduction benefit, what percentage of each of those funding pieces can we use in our programmatic analysis? And then those investment categories on the left column, then uh, on this graphic are the green boxes on the left. So then we crosswalk each of these different categories into different adjustment factors that we have in our travel model. So when we talk about additional active transportation, we don't model sidewalks, we don't model bike lanes, we don't model regional trails in our travel model, but how can we show those investments in the plan? So in this example for active transportation, we can change our pedestrian bicycle attractiveness factors. We can change our improved transit access factors in the model. So this is done for each of those different categories moving down the line and how those walk over into different factors that we have in our model. And then the last piece related to this programmatic analysis is also the temporal aspect. So our 2050 RTP is fiscally constrained. We're not spending more money than we think we have over the next 30 years, but we also have to make sure we're not spending more money than we think we have in a period so between 2021 and 2030, we have a certain amount of money. We can't spend more than that. So this exercise is also taking into account when do we think that funding within each of these categories can be available and when can we record those benefits related to GHG emission reductions. So another reiteration, we don't believe our programmatic strategies alone are going to help us achieve our GHG reduction target. So we're currently testing almost many scenarios. Uh, related to our, our projects and investment mix as we currently have in the RTP. Uh, that includes refocusing scopes of some of the roadway capacity projects that we have. So we're emphasizing complete street safety retrofits more. Um, we're looking at advancing some select BRT corridors based on coordination with project sponsors and their development process. And then we're also looking at if we're able to free up additional funding, can that go to more multimodal improvements in the plan and can those happen quicker in the plan so we're able to reap those benefits sooner and take uh, take credit for those sooner and meet our pretty aggressive GHG reduction targets. To bring our process slide back, uh, like I mentioned, we're in, in slides three and four of this analysis. Um, still going through our programmatic, uh, still going through the testing of those different mini scenarios. Uh, we've been coordinating with CDOT, with RTD, with local project sponsors. What are some appropriate steps we can take in the plan related to projects and investments? And we've at the same time been looking at what are some appropriate mitigation measures for the region that the board could commit to, could adopt, um, that we'd be comfortable, that makes sense for Dr. Cog and our different member governments, and what uh, is going to be able to be tracked annually. So when we, if we do go the mitigation action plan route, we do then have an annual tracking mechanism. And so we want to make sure that those measures that we are also looking at can be tracked easily and we're able to report on those and report on progress easily. And again, all of this just to make sure our GHG reduction targets and don't face a restriction on our federal funds in the MPO area by Dr. Cog. Uh, that's the last slide. I'm happy to take any questions uh, and I'll also be relying on staff for any difficult questions. Thank you, Alvin. Questions, comments from anyone? Director Williams. Sorry, sorry, Chair. But don't, no apology necessary. Um, okay, so I don't see any uh, planning in here for marketing. 
to involve the people who are driving cars to have to get out of their cars and on transportation, which is one of the primary ways that we are going to reduce greenhouse gas in our region. And we need to involve more than the people in this room. We need to involve the entire populace of the MPO in a commitment to reducing greenhouse gas. I recently told a room full of people that you are killing your grandchildren every time you turn the key in your car, which, of course, got a big groan from the room. But I had one of Kevin's peers who was there tell me recently that every time she gets in her car now, she hears my voice. <laughs> and so you all are going to hear me say that over and over and over again, because each and every person in this MPO has to be personally responsible for a commitment to the future of the air that we breathe. Thank you. Thank you. Not knowing which of my peers you're talking about, I wonder if they have grandchildren yet. So, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Silverstein. Yes, thank you. And, and it seems like this last presentation tied things together very well for me from the, all we've heard today and in previous meetings because all of the, the goals and the aspirations of everything really didn't have an enforceable mechanism. And this greenhouse gas strategy that you know recently been adopted requires it, requires this all to come true, the investments in, in you know, density and, and in bicycle and, and pedestrian access and multi-modes. Multi I was, you know, um, trying to think of the, of, different ways to phrase things as we've heard these. And I keep, I keep thinking of mobility versus transportation because mobility, although it's, you know, we all think of transportation in a way the I think the world out there, we're a car centric culture and transportation to them means cars. And so how do we turn that conversation to mobility where, Hey, you're, you're, you're by making investments in walkable neighborhoods, so many of these things can happen, and this greenhouse gas rule um, and the way that's um, outlined here to achieve it really can help make that um, a reality over our next 30 years. So, you know, thank you to the um, Transportation Commission for adopting the rule and all of the work that went into that, and Dr. Cog's assessment of how to get there and the strategy that's being put forward. So, I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Ed Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike, thank you for your comments. I, I would like to um, extend my appreciation to staff and the amount of work that they've done. It has been a significant lift um, to get to where we are today related to this uh, this rule. We're we're nowhere near the finish line on this, but, uh, but at least we can we can probably see it. Um, you know, I want to thank especially you know Robert Spots and his staff uh, are working on the technical side, working trying to determine, you know, how sensitive our models are to certain parameters and all that kind of good stuff has been, a, again, a significant lift for staff. So thank you all very much. Um, you know, I can't believe I'm going to use this term, but we are, you know, we're building the plane as we fly it. I mean, we really don't know, and we worked so closely, and thank Rebecca and her staff for, for the, the collaboration that we've had to get to this point. But we're... Uh, we're still working to try to find find the solutions and, and uh, the, the mitigation policy document that you guys have now created will really help in, in solidifying where we're, where we're going. So thank you all very much. Thank you. You know, when you were, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. Didn't mean to interrupt you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, <clears throat> what Doug was saying and, and focus on that some clues because we while we don't have kind of final numbers yet it's becoming clear to us that sort of changes to the plan are not going to fully get us to the reduction targets so we probably are heading towards that four step of considering mitigation measures and the, and I want to I want to just warn you all those will not be easy conversations um, and there are there are limited authorities that we have as an agency and as so, and we will rely on our partners to work with us on considering what what mitigation measures um, are appropriate for the region and that we can get buy-in from our partners to actually um, achieve. Thank you. When we talk, and I'm thinking of uh, what uh, Directors Williams and Silverstein were saying, 
we can do everything in this plan, but if the decisions made by two and a half million individuals are different according to their needs, if we don't understand their needs and their travel patterns, uh, we're not going to hit those targets. I'm thinking of the news that was out recently about I Central 25 and, and uh, the fact that people may be I, – I drive that on occasion from Santa Fe to 6th Avenue on my way in. So I, I see that congestion constantly, southbound and northbound. And how many of those trips are supplantable by alternate modes, I don't know. Is there a way, Alvin, to quantify that? I'm not sure that there is. Uh, how can we determine the origin and destination of those? I think the last time I looked at Central 25, and this was a long time ago, it was a quarter million trips a day. Uh, it's probably greater now. So how do we quantify how many of those folks don't need to be there and how can we make it easier for them to make a different choice? Uh, is that is that a tool that we even have? Um, I think there are two pieces to that. There's the project levels analysis that goes into the actual Central 25 project, and then there's our regional travel model, which at a regional level um, is just looking at those origin destination points, um, how a person in the model travels based on those different attractiveness factors. So I'd... Uh, follow up the further answer based on what our travel demand model staff indicate. But there are two pieces of that analysis that we can look at, one through our travel model, but then what's also been done through CDOT's work with the PEL and their own more specific project limit data for mm -hmm. who's traveling along that corridor. Right. Okay. Any other discussion, Director Stanton? Uh, thank you very much for the briefing. And I wanted to add that at the Transportation Commission, uh, we made sure that there would be an opportunity to revise as we went ahead. The old build, measure, learn. In fact, I think with our PD, we have uh, something built in there for next January. And so that will give TPRs and MPOs a chance to send back in uh, suggestions to Rebecca's team and also so that we can, you know, they've done a superb job as of today, what they know, but there's a lot more that could be coming, as you mentioned, uh, Chair Flynn. Thank you. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. We seem to think that we can control everything, you know, within Dr. Cog, but there's so many outside influences. The outside influences are east-west traffic, uh, interstate truck traffic, you mentioned I-25 traffic coming down through there. Air quality. We are not an island in Colorado. We have an effect from Utah, Arizona regions, and Colorado, uh, California smoke, as we have been seeing. So I think we need to have this in the back of our mind. We do everything we possibly can and some more. But there are some other factors building, increased freight traffic, et cetera, that may put a wrench into those 2025 um, GHG reduction and uh, 2030 modeling. Thank you. Thank you. Director Will. Um, I see things about switching modes. I was curious about how you're dealing with electric vehicles. How much on congestion house gas? All right, so there are other pieces to the GHG rule as well. We're only focusing on what is really within Dr. Cog's wheelhouse related to the GHG emission reductions. Um, the model does build in electric vehicle uh, penetration rates throughout throughout the analysis years for the model, but um, related to our part of the targets, we're really focusing on what Dr. Cog and our investment in the plan, what potential mitigation measures we might go down, what we can uh, implement and invest in over the next 30 years. So that is taken into consideration, <clears throat> but it's not specifically through our investment strategy that we're bringing before you all today. Thank you. Interesting, If does the model, when we take into account electric vehicles, and of course they're not emitting uh, GHG, uh, but it's offset at the generating station, at least in currently, and I know we're reducing that, Excel is reducing that gradually. Uh, does the model take into account that uh, every uh, electric vehicle that uh, that supplants a, a, an internal combustion engine uh, has to charge overnight and you have GHG emissions from the stationary source? Uh, I do not believe so. 
good. <laughs> I was going to say good. <laughs> we don't we don't want to add any back in if we can manage to reduce any. <laughs> Thank you. It's still in the atmosphere, but uh, it's not on our side of the ledger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't tell anybody we said that. We're not broadcasting still, are we? <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, the last item, next to last item, is uh, uh, member comment and other matters, and we have uh, the stack review. Who does it? Who does the stack review? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'll start. I, I, um, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to maybe just. Um, Introduce this. This is sort of new to the to the agenda topic and um, or to the agenda, and I, I I feel like it's important for this group because this is all of our partners represented around the table in terms of our metropolitan planning um, responsibilities for for transportation. And so I wanted to have I want to sort of introduce the notion that this shouldn't just be sort of Dr. Cog topics that um, our partners. I want to make sure that this group is well informed and aware of sort of things that are going on at CDOT and at RTD so that we're thinking of this group as a more comprehensive transportation planning group, not just a Dr. Cog group, because it is far from that. And so this was a first attempt to just sort of surface those issues and just, I think maybe I'll take a quick opportunity. This agenda went out prior to the last staff meeting, and so I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the things that the statewide transportation advisory committee that advises the transportation commission talking about last week at their meeting. And I will admit that I was not present at that meeting. So apologies, but um, there were some important discussions about the greenhouse gas policy update in terms of the mitigation measures that we talked about. And so um, once that is adopted, um, I would like to, in our future conversations around the regional transportation plan, have some discussion here about the mitigation measures policy directive that the commission is poised to adopt uh, Thursday this week. And sort of just so everyone has, has that awareness. And um, there was also some discuss, some presentations, some updates on some of the new um, enterprises that were created in Senate Bill 260, um, the non-attainment area um, enterprise, the uh, clean fleets enterprise, the clean transit enterprise. So. Senate Bill 260 created all these new enterprises that have very specific purposes and new dedicated funding streams. So updates to that. We have had presentations at the Transportation Advisory Committee, so the local staff are aware of those and, um, and the work that's going on around those enterprises. Um, and then there was a discussion about some proposals by CDOT to expand busting service throughout the state, some of the interregional sort of um, transit connections uh, through busting. And that information is all available on CDOT's website. You can search for STAC. Just wanted to bring those forward and, again, also invite a discussion about how can we better integrate at this group sort of discussion about sort of those statewide CDOT and RTD topics. Um, this was just a first attempt to prompt that conversation. Thank you for the indulgence, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Any questions? Any comments? Director White? Um, I would just say I, I, I'd welcome that, and it may be that um, my participation on this group helps to create that connection, at least for the stack. And if you want to make it an ongoing agenda item, I'm very happy to report out on, on what the um, stack discussed. Are you stack in particular versus the Transportation Commission? There's just a lot going on at CDOT, but. I think typically what the. Sometimes the the board, the commission agenda packet isn't available when we send out this agenda packet. So, um, but we certainly can um, consider. I, I think those are both relevant, Rebecca, and, and important. So we can we can just um, we can address that either way. Mr. Chairman, if I may, to that point, um, also I, maybe it's a maybe it's a good idea that we also get an update from on a, from RTD and some of the young, you know the upcoming issues associated with too. Thank, thank you. So we should add this as a as a standing item on the agenda, and CDOT and RTD would come prepared as well. Thank you. Uh, while we're talking about, <laughs> Bill and I got it. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> while, we're, while we're talking about stack, I got an email from uh, our member uh, Tammy Marr from Centennial that stack has moved its. A regular meeting day to a day that she cannot attend, and I'm wondering: is there could there be consideration of 
uh, looking at a date that that all members can actually attend. Uh, otherwise, we will have to uh, recruit from our board uh, another person to represent Dr. Cog on the stack. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, so the background here is that the uh, State Transportation Advisory Committee, the group we've been talking about, has been um, meeting for the last couple of years on the second Friday, I think, um, of the month, um, which has really proved a lot of problems uh, for the timing with our Transportation Commission, which meets the following week. So for the last about two or three months, we've been trying to find an alternative date that would um, provide a little bit more spacing between those two groups. Uh, we have focused on the end of the week because most of the stack is elected officials with conflicts earlier. I will say we have not been able to find a single date that didn't have a conflict for someone. So uh, last week, Stack did decide to go ahead and move it to the pay. I understand that doesn't. Director Maurer, I'm not sure that any date would work. I know no date would work for, for, everybody. for everybody. So um, I don't know if, if the fact that it's a virtual meeting helps at all. I'm guessing not. Um, I, I, I'm a bit stuck myself. Uh, if, uh, if there's anything I can do on my end to help uh, Dr. Cog identify a new member, you know, get a new member up to speed. But we're, we're sort of at that place now. There is no date that would work for everyone. All right. Uh, Doug, we have executive committee tomorrow. Why don't we talk about this? Yes, we do. We okay. Do. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other comments? Go I got ahead. one other thing. Just a bit. Um, anybody who parked downstairs, I do have parking validation. So please just see me or raise your hand or whatever, and we'll get them to you. Thank you. Other matters by member, members rather. Uh, Commissioner Stan, did you want to raise the point you mentioned to me? No, I think you mentioned it. I found it ironic that we're meeting in person at a time when we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases. And for those of us who live out in the netherworld, I live up past Rocky Flats. Um, this will, I'll make three full trips into Denver this week. This is the first one. And it's a quick one, you know, for a two-hour meeting. So I would respectfully ask to reconsider. I think it's a good idea to have in-person meetings every, you know, for certain times, but also hybrid because I've heard from other directors a similar concern. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on that? Yeah. All right. We can we can talk about that again at exec committee. Uh, the reason for it is that. You know, obviously, being in person is a great advantage to building relationships and working together. As it, I mean, it's good to see everybody in three dimensions, uh, except maybe you, Jeff. <laughs> I haven't seen you in probably 10, 20 years <laughs> in person. Uh, thank you. Our next meeting is uh, June 14th, and I see no other business on our table. So with that, we will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.